give you um, some additional information. That's fine. That's fine. Additional information to what I uh, was speaking about at the um, symposium before. And as you see here, we again are talking about classification and diagnosis and reducing mainly the diagnostic delay. That is the topic of this presentation. Well, again, we are all rheumatologists and uh, sometimes we give presentation to other, presentations to other disciplines and we want to show how these patients would develop over time. I do not know exactly how the situation is here in Colombia at the moment, but I believe that, generally speaking, by the way, somebody forgot uh, their glasses here. <laughs> and generally speaking, um, we are in the meantime able to see the patients in the more or less left side of the slide. This means in a younger and earlier age or time in life. I also mentioned that before, we very much believe, although the likelihood ratio, the diagnostic value of inflammatory back pain is not that big, we very much believe that we know what is happening to these patients. Why their back pain, the main symptom to come to the rheumatologist, is inflammatory. And for understanding that, we have set up questions that we reply with a yes or no. And the more of these questions we reply with a yes, the closer we are to inflammatory slash axial spondyloarthritis situation. So we have chronic duration, we had young age, slow onset, patients who improve with movement, but worsen when they, when they sit or they lie down, especially in the night. They wake up and they have back pain with a stiffness in their back. It is buttock pain that is right or left side, not only right or not only left. And they have a good response to non-steroidals. I'm pretty sure you've heard all of this before, but I would tell you that this is not exactly the case, that we count the positives and the closer these positives are there, the closer we get to spondyloarthritis. I will show you why. First of all, Yes, we have the criteria, different criteria for inflammatory back pain. I go back one slide. This is the summary of this criteria. This is the criteria of collection of different items. At the moment, we use the right definition, the IBP definition by ASAS for defining inflammatory back pain in studies at least. And we also include the good response to non-steroidals. I go back one slide again. The good response to the non-steroidals is not included in this um, criteria. And good response to non-steroidals means, on the left side, that within two or three days only, very fast, the patients with spondyloarthritis will show improvement and the patients with mechanical degenerative back pain need much longer time. So the, not only the good, but the very fast response is important. So speaking about diagnostic delay in a patient with chronic inflammatory back pain in a young age, the question is how can we get these people to us, to the rheumatologist? In the year 2004, 2005, we at ASAS have developed a screening approach. This is not validated, it was just an idea, yeah? Where everybody said, well, if you have chronic back pain and a young age, that either you have inflammatory back pain or you have MRI positive or you're B27 positive, please go and visit the rheumatologist. This was very artificial. Nobody has validated that. And the problem came later when in population studies like this one in the US, the inflammatory back pain was examined. So what they did here was to go around the US with a truck and ask the general population 
if they fulfill the questions of the inflammatory back pain criteria. And what you see here in those different criteria, the Colin criteria, the SSG criteria, there was a definition there, or the Berlin set, there was, and you see that in the upper part, five to six percent of the general population independent of age. Five to six percent of the general population in the US, <clears throat> they would fulfill the, the, the inflammatory back pain criteria. That doesn't mean that they have spinal arthritis. But if we want to come to closer, closer to a shorter diagnostic delay, we need to rule out those false positive patients. And by the way, it was interesting to see that this proportion, five to six percent, was independent of the age. So it was not that the young people only have inflammatory back pain and the older people have chronic non-inflammatory back pain. Everybody had inflammatory back pain. And there was also no difference between males and females. So it's not that the, that the young old male has spondyloarthritis related inflammatory back pain. Also the older lady may have fulfilled the criteria. So as you see, coming closer to an early diagnosis and also coming closer to decreasing the diagnostic delay cannot just be an issue of inflammatory back pain based on this data. Then there was this study from the UK, from, London, from England. And then they, what they did there was to take not the general population, but take everyone who came to the GP the general practitioner and complain about back pain. And they gave them the questionnaires and they found numbers up to 15, 16, 14 to 16 percent. You see that on the right side, independent of males and females. So if we obviously look carefully to that population that we want to go to, this means young people who go to the doctor not to the rheumatologist, who go to the doctor for back pain, we will find many who fulfill the criteria for inflammatory back pain, and the question is now how many of them will have spondyloarthritis. We will answer this question in a second. What we also did in Germany was then to try to say, you know, in daily practice, what should we ask the GP for to send us the right patient to the to the rheumatologist to get a proper diagnosis early. Should we make it very easy? This is strategy number one. The old strategy from Azas. Young people, chronic inflammatory back pain, B27 positive or sacroiliitis. That's easy. Or should we make it more difficult? Strategy number two. And add positive family history, or good response to non-steroidals. More difficult or more easy, it depends on how you see it, but at least you add two questions. And what was found out was that there was no big difference. So if you look into those two referral strategies, you see similar um, proportions of patients finally having spondyloarthritis based on the strategies that I show you. That's the one thing. So maybe even the easy part of the disease for the general practitioner is good enough to find those patients who they should send us to the rheumatologist. The very threatening, threatening thing, I, I believe, is also that out, out of these people who they recruited in that study, 23 to 25%, so 25.8 to 22.7%, had already ankylosing spondylitis, and nobody knew it. So we need to improve. There is also other attempts. For example, here, this study from the Netherlands, where they try to put together some points within those concepts, and in this algorithm, and you see below, on the right side, they say that depending on the cutoff point, you can make it more or less sensitive or specific. I'm not a very big fan of that, and I will show you why and what we understood in the last couple of years. What we understood, and now I'm citing studies that we published, not because we are better than the others, but because we, we do have a lot of patients to, 
to examine in that part. What we understood is that if you want to work with a general practitioner or with an orthopedic or with anybody else who may send you the right patients, because you don't want to see the patients you don't need. You want to see those people who most probably will develop on arthritis. It makes sense to apply such a um, strategy. Chronic symptoms, young age, and then already before you see the patient, they have been asked, is there buttock pain, which improves by movement, and does the patient have psoriasis? If two out of the three of these items are positive, then it makes sense to refer to the rheumatologist. If one of these items is positive or none, then it makes sense to examine HLA-B27. And if positive, then refer to the rheumatologist. And the result that you get is this one. Eight out of the 10 people you will see will end up having the disease. And more or less seven to eight people you will not see, they will have nothing. So you miss very few who will come later, unfortunately, but you also see the right ones. And you don't spend the time, your time with, let's say, things that are not so important. And at the end, I have to say that, this is already, uh, this is in the meantime published, Although this seems to, be, so seems to be very difficult to follow, you can make it even easier. What we did in this study was to take patients who came to the GP and to the orthopedic. And they all had back pain, just simply back pain. They were all below 45 years of age. And here on the left side, you see this X X13, X16, whatever. X is one of the symptoms. You see on the right side, these are the SPA features. We took, uh, show this as an example, we took all the SPA features that we know. And this is just one small piece of the table that we created. On the right side, you see what these symptoms are. Now, if you look at the numbers, the most important things are either the likelihood ratios or the predictive values, positive and negative predictive value, okay? This is the disease. You will see that you have no difference in the first row, in the second row, in the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and so on. These are the top 10. This very much means that obviously for really fishing out the right patient, I go back. You do not even need such a complicated algorithm. You just need a young person who has three symptoms, any. A young person with chronic back pain and any three symptoms. Let's say you may have, let's play this uh, around, you may have someone with pain in the thoracic spine, inflammatory bowel disease, this is this X3, 13 and 16 and positive CRP. The probability to have spondylarthritis is very high. You may have someone who has inflammatory bowel disease, positive family history, and CRP. You may have someone who have, here, the second from last, uveitis, psoriasis, and um, pain in the cervical spine. This means the symptom number is obviously in this disease very important, and the likelihood ratios we collect and the probability that we come closer to the right diagnosis is much higher if you have three or more symptoms. And this is how we now try to evaluate this even further to decrease the diagnostic delay. Now, this has been a little bit of a controversial topic even in Germany. These are, again, German data from databases where in the upper part you see the first point of symptoms and the point of diagnosis. And we found that we have been able in Germany to decrease the diagnostic delay to 6.7 years from 10 years that it was ago, um, long ago. It is still not good enough. You have seven years of symptoms and you, nobody knows what you have. Well, unfortunately, I go back. Based on this kind of efforts we've made, we will imp hopefully improve it. 
It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're a male, so stratification by sex plays a role. It matters if you're B27, and it matters if you have psoriasis. But these are obvious things. So I just want to say any three items are good enough to differentiate the patient who will come to the rheumatologist or not. Two is not enough. Four is much better. Yeah, this is the way we think. So I'm trying now to put numbers into clinical practice. It's not always very easy, but this is how it works. One other thing you need to take into account is that males and females may be different in the way they express their symptoms and the way they will come to the diagnosis. You see on the right side, bottom, how males and females express their pain, in which area and how strong it is. And it seems that females have more symptoms in the upper part of the spine Males have more symptoms in the lower part of the spine, although they have the diagnosis. And they also, you see the red colors, females seem to have a more subtle feeling for, of pain, or males may sometimes not want to say that they are in pain. Nevertheless, without going into all the details of this slide because of the time, the way patients, female and male patients express their pain is different. Now, we also need to take into account that we may have, when I speak about females and back pain, it always comes the question, what about fibromyalgia? We need to take into account that there also might be concomitant fibromyalgia in our patients. In this study, what we did was to take 300 patients, 100 with fibromyalgia, and we tried to apply the diagnostic criteria of 2010, the um, classification criteria of 1990, and the ASAS classification criteria of 2009. And we found that, of course, 100% of these patients had fibromyalgia based on the fibromyalgia ACR criteria, but only 2% could have been classified for spondyloarthritis. So the fibromyalgia patient is not a problem. The problem is the spondyloarthritis patient, because he or she, every fourth, 24%, 25%, may have concomitant fibromyalgia. And then you don't know what to do with your pain. If you look into the longer and the lesser standing disease, ankylosing spondylitis and non-radiographic axpa, the AS have more fibromyalgia concomitant. And in the non-radiographic axpa, and that's a problem, the imaging arm, those who are MRI positive, may have even more fibromyalgia, at least more of them may have fibromyalgia, which very much means that there is a systemic inflammatory nature in this fibromyalgia pattern. We know that from other studies, but that's a different topic. So altogether, our patients may also have pain, chronic inflammatory back pain maybe even. You remember, not every inflammatory back pain is spondylarthritis. That may be due to fibromyalgia or may be overinterpreted. Now, what about other things? I've brought this slide from the other slide library. These are older data which still hold true. Um, that's why I mention it all the time. Positive family history is important. Uh, you see that in the last bullet, if, you're, if you have a first degree relative who is B27 positive and then you have back pain, then your risk is 12%. And this is um, much higher than usually. How do we deal with imaging? Well, there is a lot to say about imaging. I will keep it brief. Um, we have a definition of a positive MRI, which means we have to have a lot of bone marrow edema in the sacroiliac joints, more than two or three of these lesions around the joint. This is, goes back to 2009, more than 10 years ago, where we set up this definition. In the meantime, we know that not only the edema itself but also the extent of the edema and the signal, how, signal, how high the signal is plays a role. Because if you have an area with a lot of edema, as compared to an area with little edema, the area of a lot of edema is much more risky to develop structural changes later. So it's not only the presence, but also the extent of the edema that plays a role. And this is something we also need to take into account. Now, the problem, on the other hand, is that there have been studies 
that were published many years later, like the one in the top from Belgium or the one in the bottom from the Netherlands, that found that in the Belgian study, military recruits after a long march, they may also have bone marrow edema. Or here in the Dutch study, healthy volunteers or women after pregnancy, they may also have bone marrow edema on the sacroiliac joints. So what do we do with that? We have taken 800 people in Germany, all below 45 years. They have no, in, no problem, no pain. And we did an MRI examination. These are the data that, this is the results that you see here. In 18%, let's say around 20%, every fifth of these healthy, healthy volunteers had edema. You see that there. This is the same patient, three consecutive slices. Yeah. So obviously edema is very unspecific too. So what I can tell you is, and I believe very much in that concept, it is inflammatory back pain that we will interpret it properly. It is the right algorithm we need to apply to get the patient to us. And when we apply the imaging, on the left side is the spondyloarthritis patient. Where is, the MRI, where is the positivity? It is there where I have put the arrows, in the middle of the joint. In the patient with bone stress, no spondyloarthritis, you may also have edema, but it's in the more anterior part of the joint. In the middle of the joint, you have cartilage. In the anterior part of the joint, you have ligaments that pull. So edema is very unspecific. Well, the problem is obviously that we still have to use it because if I show you this X-ray and I can tell you that this patient was submitted to a clinical study because of symptoms and I enlarge the sacroiliac joints, it would be nice to, tell, to ask here in the room how many of you believe that this X-ray is positive and how many of you believe that this X-ray is negative. And I can tell you that even among experts, there is no clear answer. Yeah, there is, you can say that these joints, for example, are extremely nicely shown. Yeah, there is no interruption. There is no erosion. They are a little bit closer, but maybe this is because the X-ray was done in a standing position. On the, um, on the left side, there is some blurry image. There is some sclerosis. But this might, might also be due to the age of the patient. So altogether, MRI is important. And this is why, and I show the, the, the slide that I showed you before, we need to take into account especially the MRI findings for both the, sorry, for both the inflammatory lesions that you cannot see so nicely here on the screen now, um, and also the chronic lesions that I've put in on that image, on the T1 image with erosions and fat. I have to say that I like this study here a lot, not because it's ours, but because I believe it shows what we see in the clinics. What we have found in that study was that assuming everything that I told you was true, you're able to assess the right patient early enough and you do the MRI. You're the rheumatologist and you say there is spondyloarthritis or there is no spondyloarthritis. And you also have a radiologist who is expert. And the radiologist says there is spondyloarthritis or there is no spondyloarthritis. If you see the 97 patients out of the 300 where the rheumatologist says there is SPA and the report of the radiologist is positive, all these patients had chronic changes, or the vast majority. And very few, 7% have only edema. If you see the ones where we say as rheumatologists there is no SPA and the radiologist also says there is no SPA, you see very nicely, there is no chronic lesions. So altogether, to, in order to answer the, the title of my topic, how to make an earlier diagnosis, please pay attention to where the patients come from, if inflammatory back pain is indeed true inflammatory, and also check the images when you do them. You remember the MRI is important. When you do them, check the images not only for edema, but also for chronic changes. 
So I come back to the classification criteria. They are classification criteria. We need diagnosis. The classification criteria say sacroiliitis. They don't say anything about chronic changes, unfortunately. That's why the question before was, can I do the diagnosis without criteria? Yes, you can do that. Because here you have inflammation only. But you need structural changes as well to make the diagnosis properly. Now, very briefly, how can we improve that? Also because of the time. We know that there is a definition of a positive MRI for chronic changes. This means you have to have fat around the joint, which is homogeneous with a very good distinction to the other bone marrow, together with erosions. These are the things we pay attention at. And there is also something we, and others have also published, i show you our data because I know them better, something that we also um, use in daily practice now as an MRI examination. You see that in the upper left part, it's a so-called VIBE technique. You see that on the right side. It's a very fast MRI technique that shows you the erosions even on the MRI. You don't need the CT and you don't need an X-ray anymore. So you do an MRI and you also see very nicely the erosions very clearly. This is a healthy individual with a normal VIBE image. Um, just as a view to the future, there are also now new techniques that we are applying. This is not for daily practice. What we did here was to exam examine the spine of patients with spondyloarthritis very early and degenerative patients or healthy controls. And we found that already in the back pain patients, we see the generation of the cartilage within the disc. That's something you, you may see in the next couple of years. The values that I show you in the very upper part of, this, of, the, of the table are the only significant ones between healthy controls and SPA. So I finish telling you that if we ask ourselves what is axial spondyloarthritis, there is no clear definition. This means we don't have one diagnosis only. It may be that it is pattern one, as they show here, inflammatory back pain and peripheral findings. Pattern two, inflammatory back pain and peripheral findings with at risk. There may be also other patients who are at risk always or only axial. And you see here that many different items. I come back to what I said before. It is you or me or everybody who is understanding what spinal arthritis is and make the diagnosis. And it's not the classification criteria. So if we want to come closer to, um, to, the, um, um, to uh, early diagnosis, we need not only to rely on MRI or not only to rely on CRP and so on, we need to take the entire clinic into account. And by that, I'm ready. Thank you.